Hello and welcome everyone to Skinworks. I'm John Oriarte, curator of uh, digital programs at the Photographer's Gallery. Uh, Skinworks is a collaborative program by Photo Museum Winter Tour in Switzerland and the Photographer's Gallery in London with the support of Pro Helvetia. Uh, Skinworks is a series of online streams led by artists who perform guided explorations of the spaces where their core artistic practice takes place. Since we started in April 2020, every event has taken a different format that can sit in between a performance, a lecture, a workshop, and a conversation. The artists, curators, and researchers that have been invited have taken us to online marketplaces, virtual worlds, social media, data platforms, video games, corporate geographies, 3D modeling programs, CCTV cameras, among so many other places and technologies. Uh, the stream today will last around an hour. Uh, we'll see how how long uh, we <laughs> will will take us uh, on her on her event tonight. Uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, your microphone should be muted. Uh, if not, please go ahead and mute it now. And uh, yeah, so you know this event is being recorded and will be archived. So if you don't want to be recorded, please turn off your camera. Uh, and uh, and we won't be recording your your face. Uh, you can check your previous skin uh, or previous skin works on skinworks.com. Hi everyone, my name is Marco De Mutis. I'm digital curator at Photo Museum Winter Tour. Today we will be led on a virtual studio visit of artist and researcher Winnie Soon. We will not only be taken on our guest screen but we will dive deep and open up the hidden layers that regulate networked images, exploring the role of data and its relationship to objects, entities, flows, and thoughts. Through experimental and artistic use of diagramming and coding, Soon's practice reveals the political and aesthetical dimensions of coded and networked images and explores the technical and cultural imaginaries of programming from its inside. By opening up the opaque and inaccessible layers behind the pixel surface of images and interfaces, the artist and researcher unearth the power dynamics of the infrastructure that regulate the circulation of knowledge, exposing digital censorship, class inequality, gender ideology, data politics, colonial structures, and the problematic legacies that are inherited, recuperated, and reinforced in the visible, invisible, in the invisible and invisible computational cultures we inhabit. Born and raised in Hong Kong, Winnie Soon is an artist researcher interested in querying the intersections of technical and artistic practices as a critical praxis, with works appearing in museums, galleries, festivals, distributed networks, papers, and books. Researching in the areas of software studies and computational practices, Soon is currently based in Denmark and working as associate professor at Aarhus University. Their book, Aesthetic Programming, a Handbook of Software Studies, written with Jeff Koch, is out now by Huma Open Humanities Press. Buy the hard copy, download the PDF, and check their GitHub right after the screen walk. But before that, Winnie, thanks for accepting our invitation. And the screen is now yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. OK. Um, thanks so much, uh, Marco and John, uh, organizing these screen walks. Um, and also, welcome for everyone uh, joining on Friday. Um, so for today, um, so maybe let me share the screen first. Um, I, I, but okay, before I share the screen, I just want to say a little bit is, I imagine this screen walk is more like a virtual studio wizard. So in a way it is less formal as a, like a academic talk or presentation. So I really want you to sort of, if you have any questions that you want to interrupt, feel free to, to do it and also discuss things together along the way. You know? So let me, I don't have a proper PowerPoint slides, but I have a lot of browser tapes. Um, I hope it works. Uh, um, but I don't have any sound. Um, so I hope you can see uh, my screen right now, right? Okay. So um, for today agenda was my plan uh, for, for the first hour at least. Um, I want to talk about the works uh, briefly, or, or I, I will pick one of the work to sort of like bridge uh, the gap or, or bridge um, the two areas uh, in relation to like images and coding. 
Um, so that's sort of like to contextualize um, what I've been working on and what exactly is my interest, because it will help to further talk about the diagramming practice with coded image, right? So the first part will be more like I select one of the work of mine to unfold some of the interesting, I think it's interesting, aspect on image with code. Then we will talk about diagrams and diagramming and show you some of the existing example, which is done by other artists and designers. Uh, but then I will also walk through some of the examples uh, that I have been working on because I, I think I have put it up in my synopsis or, or abstract is something like still work in progress. So it's pretty much I'm also inviting you to join my thinking together. What, what is what is it interesting in diagramming? Why is it this form of like coded diagram is interesting um, for us, right? But also, I at the end, I also want to walk through um, the tool that I have been using lately called GraphWiz. Uh, it's a data visualization tool usually used for um, in the field of data science. But you know, like how artists enjoy is like try to reappropriate the tool and try to see the limit and potential of the tool. So it is it's quite fun. I feel like uh, so. Hopefully, we will all uh, will have some fun about that. Um so I, I maybe I just start with uh, like this is just a website of mine. Uh, uh, Marco just mentioned about I'm an artist researcher just in case for some of you might not know my work before. So I don't really have a very particular medium that I, I work with in my artistic practice. Not necessarily is image because I also a lot of the time I work with text. Uh, characters uh, as well as voice. I'm also very interested in audio, especially what does it mean by giving voice to others, right? But I think what really unites uh, the medium that I'm interested in is the aesthetics of computational or computation or the coding aspect that I think is really central to my work. So, but but coding for me does not necessarily mean to create a very complex system. I actually like to work with really simple code, just a few lines or even within a hundred lines of code uh, as a way to open up some of the thinking, the way of how we see and how we experience images, for example, that I'm going to talk about. Um, so primarily I'm working in the area of software studies and computational practices. So if I have to use one line to sum up my practice, I would say I'm using technology to think about what is technology. So today the format is slightly uh, messy, but at the same time, I, I consider it as more like a virtual studio visit. So less formal, I hope. So I start with like the first work that I want to talk about. Uh, okay. So, uh, which is called how to get my experience through internet. It is not about diagram for this first work. It's, it, it is an earlier work of mine. I think I did it in 2014, actually the original version. But then last year uh, I have updated version with a six channel uh, video um, installation, which was shown in the Digital Arts Zurich Festival in the Museum of Design, right? So I just think about like this work, uh, this particular work, uh, it's this particular work with photographs, um, images, internet networks, and also code as the material. So I will explain a little bit more. And, and I also think it is a good entry point perhaps to articulate my interest in images, especially the materiality of images, um, internet networks, uh, the relations with, with the medium and the aesthetics of code. So maybe I just show it as a, as a background so that I have something in the background. So what you are looking at uh, is an animated GIF, um, but an animated GIF in a relatively large uh, image size. So usually, you know, in the in the late 90s and early 2000, um, as if you are working on like a web designer, you need to compile a GIF image in a really small size. For example, like within 10 kilobytes because uh, it ran on a very low bandwidth. 
and it has a very particular uh, materiality in terms of an image, the GIF image, right? Um, but this uh, particular image uh, is a relatively big in size, it's larger than 10 mega megabyte, it's intentionally working in this way. Um, so, um, and, and GIF is not just only about something that we used to see when it, is, when it was in the 90s or, or 2000s, it's like a banner ad or something like uh, you will use it in your personal websites like Geocities and so on, right? But GIF is also a data, it's a data format, right? It's, it's a compression technique, right? So what is specific about animated GIF is its specificity, right? That is the short durational moving images. So with this kind of moving images, which has the concept of frames, right? And frame rates. So what it is doing right now is like it keep on looping as if like an animated GIF, but you also, at some point you see there's a uh, irregular uh, frames that are moving around. Sometimes one of the frames is actually stay a little bit longer and sometimes it's actually run smoother, right? As you can see right now, right? And then I have, write, I have written like a really small script to sort of trick the browser in a way that it will not recognize as the same image. So I, what I'm doing here is this is an image. Yes, this is an animated GIF. But also that at the same time, it's a very different image from a network point of view. Because every time when you retrieve this image, when I, when I program like a refresh for every, I think it's every 90 seconds. So it will consider this as a new image instead of an old image that usually catch in your web browser, right? So that's why every time when it refresh, it takes a little bit of time. I think it's maybe the work uh, will be more apparent if you have a low bandwidth. So I'm up for low bandwidth connections. Then you can see a little bit more about the materiality of the image. So, so back to the specificity um, uh, of, of, of a GIF, right? of a GIF image, right? So it is looping, right? So we, we know as an animated GIF, it's usually a very short duration and it's constantly in loop. You might not aware when it start and when it end, right? It's also silent without sound, unlike video, right? And then it is also come with, like you can set with a transparent background, which is a feature that, what we, that, that was released in 1989, right? So for this visual image or, or data format as a GIF, um, it has a lot of reappropriation in visual culture, for example, like internet memes on social media, which is very much part of social media usage nowadays. But also it leads to, it led to the big uh, animated GIF platform, for example, giphy.com, right? A data format that is very shareable, very social with a social dimension. Right? So if you are, I think if you are interested um, in, in the image format, there's an article by Jason Epping uh, talk about a brief history of the GIF, which I find is quite interesting. So by, by the way, you don't have to copy all the links because uh, I will have all the links put up on, on HackMD that we will work on it together later. Okay, so I, I leave it right here. So, um, but also like for that particular article uh, and also maybe some of us might be aware about uh, that art, so a lot of artists also play with this, this particular GIF format, right? For example, like Olia, Leonina, or Jody, et cetera. So after talking about the specificity of a GIF image, so then I want to talk about the work, right? How to get the mild experience through the internet, dot, dot, dot. That's the, the name of the artwork. So what has been, so how does this, this actually work is uh, I have collect online images um, from like Baidu search engine or Flickr and then Google search and other sites, right? So I have a particular preference, right? Is, is that I'm interested in the Chairman Mao, the portrait. I'm interested in the Forbidden City, which is um, the building um, uh, at the back. And then I'm also interested in the area around Forbidden City, which is the Tiananmen Square as well. So I'm interested in how things have been developed over time, right? And how we might think about um, 
the context or, or different objects um, or different subjects in the image um, with different behaviors uh, or performing how, how an image can be performed through a network. Right? Um, so what I've been doing is like I collect, for example, like around more than 30 images. Then I just layering them one by one and placing Chairman Mao portrait in the middle of the screen, right? So this approach is not something new that I made it up. This approach is actually inspired by one of the net artists called uh, Matthew Britton. And he made a work called How to Get the Mona Lisa Experience through Flickr, which was made in 2012, right? So these images uh, were collected online um, and then those are highly symbolic objects uh, in the image that relate to the economic and also political uh, development of China. Right? So in particular, I think GIF is a durational moving images and it itself, it is a looping image, right? As being a, a Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Hong Kong or uh, people born and raised in Hong Kong. So I'm interested in this kind of durational uh, development and performance. And I want to also open up the interpretation of this piece by the audience. Right? So making this GIF as a relatively big file format. So it requires from a network point of view, right? It requires a much longer loading time over the internet network because it's heavy, right? When, whenever you are loading like a hundred megabytes uh, document, it takes time to load, right? So in other words, I'm, I'm interested in the liveness of the network that shape our ways of seeing and perceiving um, an image. So what I want to show you very briefly is, is the trick that I have made. It's, it's just only a short piece of code. Uh, start from line 31 to 40 in my screen, right? So, so what I find interesting is, is, is about catch um, the notion of like storing this image and how, and then the, and the relationship about delivering an image by a web browser and how an image transmit the data packets over a network. What, what is the temporality of networks? And every network is different. Like for you, when you are loading the image in Hong Kong, for example, or loading an image here in Denmark or in UK or in Swiss, it's very different. Right? Um, and usually like this idea of caching is related to optimization of network performance and bandwidth. It's a kind of data storage, but there's an assumption behind. The assumption behind is that we want to have a fast display image, right? A fast browsing experience, right? And all this point to my interest in, in liveness. So how can we how can we break that in, in a way? So this function of a JavaScript is really simple. It's, it's just to tell the network, the, my, my server in a way, hey, this is, this is a new image. So every time when you load this animated GIF, it is not the same image. So you have to fetch the whole file again. So that's why every time when it refresh, there is a latency. It's really micro temporal uh, uh, duration in a way. Um, so, so if we don't have this line of code, it is just simply an image just keep loading and loading again because it's caching your browser. So it perceived as the same image and then you don't have this latency. And then the second bit of the code uh, in line 37 to 40 is just like the refresh time that I have set. So because the work has been exhibited in different places since 2015 in Hong Kong and then in Denmark and then in Australia. So I have been customizing what is the optimum bandwidth that can load the image in a way that you can see a little bit more about this. Maybe some of you might say it's a glitch or maybe it's the latency um, of the network. Right. So uh, again, I go back to, to this one. Um, so in a way then I'm interested in, in this notion of liveness, which I have done my PhD on this topic uh, four years ago, this kind of real time delivery and composition of an image. So although I have made this composition of an image uh, like within a certain interval of the frame, but actually every time when it reload, it has kind of like this kind of unpredictable loading of the time. 
um, and 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 I'm interested in what constitutes uh, this experience of, of lightness. And if I put and I have to put it in 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 a question, right? So I'm interested in how this kind of live gift digital format or image reconfigures the experience of of a public space and public figure such as Mao. Right? And for this one, there's actually a few iteration. Um, so I, for example, like this one, I'm also really interested in this image because you know, like for, for an image it's low progressively. So again, it's because of this latency, it actually takes time for the image to load bit by bit, right? So at one point you just only see the image because just only show a portion of it. And then sometimes nowadays, because the network is really fast, then we don't actually able to see this kind of progress. So, um, and then last year I have made a six channel videos uh, for, for the work. I think I have another image, something like, like this one, like with an animated GIF, um, the two images which is project uh, on one side. And then I also have other, um, I made a small script sort of like um, to crop different portion of the collected image and then cycling through over time. So this is like a different representation of the work. Um, but also at the same time, it's sort of like a just a position uh, to the GIF image and, and also give a sense of an idea of different image parts and what constitute an image and also the performativity uh, of an image. So in that sense, I, I would say like image is dynamic in terms of like, in terms of how, how an image entangle with the network transmission as a network image and also the operation of how uh, like the code and the network and also like the latency of different nodes of the transmission uh, that takes place. Right? So I'm sort of like interested um, in, in this topic as a way to open up my next session, which is more on, on diagram. But before I move on to the next session, I just wonder whether you have anything that you want to post in relation to, to this. So, but just in case if you have any questions or, you know, like even just uh, like how things work, you know, just simple questions, feel free to, to interrupt and, and ask. So, um, okay, so next part um, is a bit about um, diagramming. So I have given this title to Marco and John before, <laughs> which is called like messy imaginaries. Diagram is an image of, or thought, right? Um, I'm really interested in diagram as an interesting object of study. Uh, when we think of a diagram, like flowchart, which has a strong history, right? And a long history in computer science and engineering, right? It is very orderly, right? It is a process to solve a particular computational problem or engineering problem. Some people might think it is kind of rigid or it's kind of like, oh, okay, it's, it shows the flow of things that is, that is planned, that is sort of like an illustration um, of stuff, right? But what I find, uh, also find interesting about diagram is not just only about different objects and like for, for here, for example, for this particular one. So what I'm showing you here, we will work on this later. Uh, this is a platform called HackMD and it allows me to show you like on the left-hand side, which is the code that made um, the right-hand side, the diagram, right? So it, it is more like a backdrop right now, but we will work on it later. Um, so, but I also think um, the different elements in, in the diagram, it actually creates different kinds of relationships. So, so seeing the source, for example, here, right? Source, which means the source code in making the image, you kind of like, it's something also readable in a way for this particular language. Like, okay, messy and point to imageries. Imaginaries, I point to diagram. And then imaginaries, I also want to point to thought. So you kind of like also see the representation of this um, 
semantics uh, writing or, or the language, right? So, um, so in a way, I'm interested in thinking about this particular image, for example, is it an image or is it a e literature? It seems also can, put, can create like a very complex form that might be related to text, right? You can also push the boundary of what a diagram might be, right? But also at the same time, it is a source code, right? So, so I'm interested in, in this uh, dynamic status of an image, not necessarily it is an image alone, but it encompassed multiple identities, right? So, um, so for, for example, like for a diagram, you might also think about what kind of things that you want to put into to the context, um, the, the production of, of the diagram. Um, but I also think this form of diagram, in particular using graph width, which I will uh, show you later on, is I don't see it's a predetermined set of relations because uh, there's a lot of negotiation uh, with, with these two actually, or, or even writing this code. I find it's a very different experience when I work with diagram with these two and also work with like PowerPoint or Illustrator or Inkscape or, or other tools uh, that I will explain later on. Um, and also like on the other hand, I find interesting is how can we make sense of the stuff um, uh, that, that are interesting to, to, to show and, and how they create a new forms of uh, uh, relations. So before I move on, um, I just want to show you um, a few pieces of mine um, that sort of like work on diagrams. Sort of give you a sense of the trajectory and the previous practices of mine and how it comes to something like, like this one. So I start with something very traditional, right? Okay, a flow chart, right? So, there are many types of diagrams, right? But one that I'm really interested in is flow chart, right? Flow of the chart, chart of the flow, right? Some sort of directional processes and flows and sequence uh, related to time, related to how a program is being executed. So this flow chart is actually um, a representation of one of my artworks called Vocable Code. So on the left-hand side, it's really simple. It's, it's talking about like, how the program actually works, start from loading something, start starting to have some kinds of decisions, and then whether there are some kinds of text displays. Right? But then on the other side, it's sort of like I'll give you a little bit more explanation about how a program works. Right? So then I want to introduce uh, Nathan um, as Manga, who described flowchart as a design technology. Right? It consists of symbolic representation, a schematic representation of the logical structure of a computer program. Right? Some kinds of steps, or some people might call it like an algorithm, like a backbone of how a program works, right? To examine or solve particular kinds of problems. But also according to him, um, flowchart is also one of the visualization techniques, right? And if we take computer programming, um, or engineering flowchart as a point of reference. So di diagram is about representation. It's something explanatory. It's something for communication. It has a clear sense of the things. And this is also what Simon also Levin talk about primatic character. So there are some kinds of formal aesthetics there, like the lines, for example, like this one, right? Like the lines and also the geometric figures, uh, vectors, and also symmetry. This kind of like order, right? A particular order and sequence that give you a sense of how things work, right? But then um, recently, um, last, last year in, Jeff and I have published, I think Jeff is here. Uh, Jeff and I have published um, the book called Aesthetic Programming. And this is the cover uh, of the programming. Uh, like this is the black and white version, but we also have the color version. Um, we start to think about um, diagram as an, as an image of thought. Um, instead of 
visualizing how a problem is solved in engineering or in computer science. So we suggest diagramming is a practice for thinking and problem posing. So in that sense, diagramming or, or diagrams, what, what you see is about abstraction. It's about arranging the relations with entities and flows in a spatial temporal dimension. When you compare with like this one, it's, it's, it's a different types of diagram in a way, right? It's words heavy in that sense, but also like a different kinds of direction, arrows, and also distance of different entities also change the way of how it is being perceived. But also what is interesting about this kind of diagram, I, I, I'm now interested in this kind of diagram. It's like, uh, it's less orderly, but I think it's a negotiation between order and, and something slightly chaos or messy in a way. So I feel there's a, a tension between what you know and what you don't know yet, right? So just to give an example, for example, like when you have to make a diagram in PowerPoint slides or in Illustrator or in other graphical tools, you kind of already have an idea like, like this one. I kind of already have a sketch on a paper, like how things would flow, right? So in a way, PowerPoint or other graphical tools is more like executing my thoughts on how I think things should be arranged, something that I, I know, right? But what is interesting about these kind of diagram is, is something that I'm negotiating with something that I, I kind of know something, but I also don't know how it would be arranged. Because for graph viz, for this particular tool that I just um, show you a little bit about the snippet of code, um, the tool itself is automatically calculate the optimal place to place different entities and more. So in a way there's this kind of negotiation there. It's like every time when you look at the outcome, it's like, it's, it's kind of unexpected in a way. Uh, it's something that you feel is odd. You feel you, you, you know what is the sequence. It, they are concrete because you know what kind of entities are there that you want to put it. But at the same time, when things come together, it becomes like a becoming of relations. So that is exactly the interest that I think is the tensions and the decisions between attractions and the potentialities as opposed to a more formal or fixed um, image form. So for, for Simon, um, so he, for this particular article, um, he put diagram in the context of contemporary art and argued that uh, di diagramming as a form of expanded experimental aesthetic practice. So one of his articulation is the production of subjectivity. So I quote his work is like, this kind of diagram foregrounds the potentialities of the body and the world, right? And he's pretty much thinking about the forces that unfold the sequences, um, for example. So I hope you sort of like start to give you some sense of um, what particular kind of diagram that I'm interested in. But just in case, again, if you want to interrupt me and ask questions, feel free to do it. Otherwise, I will go on. We actually uh, have more questions. Yeah, yeah. There, there are a couple of questions. Uh, uh, there was a question asking about the aesthetics, about how uh, important are uh, for you the aesthetics on these uh, diagrams, if you could like a uh, uh, comment on that. Uh, you mean, I, I think it's this more particularly on, on this one, I guess, right? I, I think maybe more different diagrams, as I mentioned, is I also like, I also very much like this one as well. Um, because um, it, it's also for different purposes, right? In a way that this one is more for communication purpose or try to unfold what is, what is the algorithm doing uh, in the background, right? But again, like I'm, I'm also very fond of this kind of fixed orderly structure. It's a very particular sequence that one data go to or, or one flow actually lead to another flow. So there's a, there's a particular ways of looking at this kind of diagram. It's, it's starting from, usually starting from the top and then to the bottom, right? And then you know there's, usually there's a, with the arrows, you know there's like a loop. There's a feedback loop that you, you, you go back to the previous one and then you go on to the next one. It's a very particular order arrangement of these type of diagrams. But then for this type of diagram is, is 
is totally different, right? In a way, you still can able to trade certain kinds of order, right? For example, right? Like I just picked something. Um, so because this one is actually um, uh, designed by uh, OSP, Open Source Publishing, uh, as our designer for the book. And they also introduce us uh, the two graphics as well. So this is actually made up of the paragraph of our introduction of the book, like a short paragraph of the book. So in a way, you can also list, you can also able to see some sort of tracing the sequence of the words. For example, like a computational object open to modification and aesthetics of binary logic hierarchies, naming of programming, right? So you can also sort of trace some kind of orders, but at the very first place, when you look at it, it seems messy, but there's certain kinds of ordering there. But at the same time, if you, you, if you are the maker of, of this program as well, then you also start to see there are certain kinds of potentialities of how different words being connected in a way that is very different from how you look at it in terms of like language, like computer program, like here, for example, like you have a very strict ordering of things, of relations. But when you put into more a spatial um, uh, dimension, then it actually changed the reconfiguration of your thinking. I hope I answered the questions. Uh, are there any yeah, a lot. there was another question from B. Bogart. Um, they asked, Winnie, what do you think of the relation between these kinds of flowcharts and diagrams in relation to data flow languages, such as Pure Data and MaxMSP? Ah, oh, OK. Mm, so for those I call, they usually have a term called visual programming, right? Because they you can drag um, different forms of like functions together. But I think it's uh, what I find interesting about like these kind of programming, like this is not necessarily called visual programming, it's just, so this is a language called docked language. It's very readable in a way. So it's, it's from the source code perspective, all right? So this is not something for visual artists. I, I feel it's, this is more for uh, literature people, you know? Something that, some, something that is interesting for like, people who are interested in reading code as text, right? So it's also unfold certain kinds of logics here. So, uh, so the way of how it reads a text and how it reads as like uh, the visual programming part is, is a very different ways of navigation. And also you, for visual programming, like pure data, you also need to do like this kind of drag and drop, right? Like, okay, I, I'm interested in like this input, I put it here and then I will see how things that, but you also have the full control in a way on how these visual components are placed on your canvas in a way, right? In your programming uh, canvas, right? Uh, but, but for this particular two, what is it different from, from those like pure data? Of course, it's less, um, computational logic in a way, because it's more about like, like showing different languages that how you link things together, but it's not something that you can link to like um, input data from other sensors, or you can hook up with like the network uh, transmission of data. So it's in terms of functionality, it is less vigorous when compared with visual programming, but there's a certain kinds of unpredictability here because even you know exactly how you want to link things together, but it's still because of the spatial relations and, and also the calculation of the optimal space by the computer. So it gives you this kind of room for negotiation of, okay, so I don't expect actually these two are linked in this way. So if these two are linked in this way, what, what kind of things is open up, right? So in my thinking, I, I feel it's, it's, it's a, it's a slightly different one, but although visual programming is not, uh, I rarely touch upon, I just only uh, work with um, uh, pure data. And also sometimes I also draw data diagram as well. Uh, again, like I, I really like this kind of diagram too, because it's, it's have a particular orderly aesthetics uh, uh, there. But at the same time is how can, 
I think my fascination of this kind of diagram is how can we find some kind of chaos in this orderly pattern? Yes. Yeah. In fact, there's there's a comment on the chat that I think that links with this uh, by Shen Yu, who says that I love that when the diagram becomes less orderly, new patterns emerge. A tool to visualize instructions and flows becomes an image of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I guess that it's, it's referring to this one, to the to this uh, diagram that you have on the screen. And there's another question as well by Janice asking if, uh, have you ever shown this kind of diagram as a lecture or performance where it is animated or comes into being? No, actually this is, I, I think right now today is <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first time trying out to see whether there are actually people interested in this as well. So apparently there are also people who are similar. I think you are here also because somehow you are interested in in like finding out, because I'm still finding, I guess, I'm still finding the reason why I'm so interested in, in, in these two and, and what kind of new perspective that open up my thinking on images or on relations. So I haven't really tried, I, I think I exhibit once, but I will show that later on as well when I walk through some of the work. Yeah. Should I continue? Sure. Yeah. So the next part is I want to give you some examples um, uh, around diagram within the context of artistic practice because um, uh, Simon or Sullivan talk about diagramming as an expanded experimental artistic practice. Right? So I started to look into like who are the artists also working on these areas and and how what kind of aesthetics um, actually uh, you can see through their work, right? And um, so as mentioned, like one, one of the really interesting things about flowchart or diagramming is this kind of formal aspect, this kind of functional communicative aspect versus like the ab abstraction, the abstract relations and also the aesthetic relations, right? So one of the work perhaps some of you might already know called Google with it itself in 2005, right? Um, so this work, uh, this artwork, um, is around like to display the process uh, to show or to illustrate the process of the auto generations of revenue by hacking the Google Essence, right? And it was created by uh, Surreal in collaboration with Alessandro uh, Lodovico and Uber Mergen, right? So the project automatically triggers advertising clicks on, on website. So you can see like, like this, uh, these are the Google sites. And then uh, the GWEI of their website is actually have this kind of auto click on, on the Google AdSense, right? In order to generate money uh, or generate uh, micro payments from Google, which are in turn used to buy shares in Google. Right? So this is one way of illustrating like in a form of, I, I will also group this into like diagramming practice. And then the other project uh, called the project formerly known as Kindle Fog Bomb in 2013 by Uber Merkin. So the artwork itself, when you look at it, is very representational. It's, it's, it's unlike this like, like flow chart, right? With these square rectangle boxes, right? So, but this one is like an image simulating a letterpress, right? It's a machine process, right? So the work itself is about um, using a machine process that strips comments from YouTube videos. So display an algorithm that compile the comments and edit titles, which produce an ebook, which was subsequently uploaded to Amazon Kindle e-commerce uh, bookstore. And fog bomb is used in computing, usually <laughs> describing sort of like an attack in which a computer process continuously self replicates until the machine's resources are exhausted or the crash of the, of the system. Right? So in a way, this process is kind of represent uh, in this diagram uh, using this image of a traditional uh, printing press. Right? It's, it's a very different representation of a diagram. And then another work, The Web Stalker by IOD. Uh, so 
It's uh, the original work, the Web Stalker is an alternative browser that shows the connection of the hyperlinks. Instead of like when we go to a website and we see a lot of different links and then we just go from one link to another, right? So this alternative browser, uh, the Web Stalker shows the connections behind a website, how the hyperlinks and images uh, are related. What is the network relations? Um, in order to critique uh, the, normal the normalization of browsing. And then the last one uh, is more recent one. I think a lot of you actually know this work, um, The Anatomy of an AI System by Cage Crawford and Valenda uh, Joller. <clears throat> so the work, this particular uh, image uh, employs many visualization techniques. So for example, like a, a timeline, right? And also different forms of like radio uh, format of visualization. It is both very informative and beautifully laid out that shows different kinds of abstract relations uh, within the context of artificial intelligence systems. So all this point to the specificity of diagrams beyond traditional engineering or, or computational flowchart and paying attention to the spatial and temporal relations and forces among elements, uh, different objects, um, entities by representation. And these artworks that I have shown you or design works that I have shown you, they also is a form of aesthetics that perform criticism on certain subject matters. For example, like this one, trying to unfold some of the black box of AI, the hidden labor conditions, right? And then the web stalker one, um, sort of giving a sense of an alternative way of of seeing the web connection, right? And then the, the fog bomb project is a critique of the centralization of production, right? So it's also a different layers of, um, of aesthetics there. So the last part, so do you have any questions up to now that you want to pose or? If not, I will continue the the last part on graph width. So the last part I want to show you is uh, the software tool that I have mentioned earlier called uh, graph width, um, which is my recent artistic and technical tool for thinking. Um, so a little bit background, it is a free and open source software developed before 1991. And it is a portable software, which means you can install the application in Mac, uh, OS, Linux, and Windows. And it is now also widely used in a lot of software uh, programming language like Python, JavaScript, many others as, a, as an add-on package. Um, and it is also used by many uh, uh, data scientists as well. So if you so go to the graph with link and then click on gallery, then you can actually find a lot of different types of diagram from cluster gradients, and then you can find more something more classic around data structures, uh, entity relation um, diagram, family tree, finite uh, automations, um, and so on. Right? There are uh, different types of uh, more radio like network relations visualizing that. Um, and then, more radial layout. I think also if some of you know like something around D3, like a JavaScript library is also able to do this kind of visualization as well. So, all right. So it is, uh, so what is this actually behind uh, these uh, graphics is something called the dots uh, language. It's a stripping language. Uh, which is a graph description language, um, which focus on three main elements, that is the node, the edge, and also the, the graph attributes. So if we come back to this one, I will close all this. If we come back to this one, right? Um, it is fairly easy to write. Um, it can start with something really simple um, to signify it is a directional uh, graph, which I will talk a little bit more later. And then you just only have to put the relation of one word to another, or even you have a sentence, for example. Right? So for me, I, I think it's like relatively easy to use and also to read and understand as well. And, and also like for this kind of coding is come with like a strong natural language aspect. 
uh, because it's is something that is uh, understandable, right? Like font name, you, you know about this word, like DIR, which means direction. Uh, it's a short form of the direction and then font name and then start with sort of like, even you might not able to understand each line of it specifically, but you sort of get a sense of, of these uh, connections between uh, different uh, entities, right? And, and of course, it's like when I structure this work is, just uh, a quick prototype of this is I, of course, I have an idea what I want to make the connections, right? But once I actually have this layout and then it's executed, it becomes really something different. Like if I, if I comment out like um, the direction from, from left to right and it becomes something really a different types of diagram immediately, right? So it can change and also live executed uh, on the fly. Um, so for this particular software, GraphVis, it can also output different file formats like SVG, PNG, or PDF file. So I want to show you also some uh, GraphVis work that I have done earlier. Um, for example, like um, this one, I have to smaller the size, um, uh, which is part of the project with Helen Pritchard on the recurring queer imaginaries. So it's sort of like simulate a state diagram, the finance, finite state machine with the focus on the transition or the state of, of a particular text, whether the text is a source text or is it a machine trained and what is the transformation of the text. So it's a particular type of diagram um, that uh, we have made. Um, and then just show you before, like the black and white version. So this is sort of like the cover uh, of the book that Jeff and I have just uh, recently published uh, called Aesthetic Programming, a handbook of software studies, right? Uh, and there are also some simple diagram uh, within the chapters as well. It's more something related to maybe more leaning towards to flowchart style. But we gradually, we want to make it more complex when it comes to the bonus chapter called recurrent imaginary. So sort of like putting all the chapters um, uh, together and then to visualize um, um, as a diagram. So, um, and then the last one that I want to show you is also the recent work um, that I have made with Jeff Cox. Um, which will be published in the Nordic Journal of the Aesthetics uh, later this year. So the piece is called, What is an Image? So where we have seven cluster, including, if I zoom in a little bit, like algorithmic image, and then we have pose image, and then we have non-human image, and then we have, what is an image? We have operative image, we have also poor image and network image, right? So those are the materials that are taken from um, like a teaching material in a way. Um, and then we try to put it up as a, this kind of diagram as an image to explore the forces, the different literature and relations of the increasingly programmable image within the context of visual culture. So this is like, like the executed version of an image, but the source of an image is something like this. So it's, it's a very different temporality as you can see, and also spatial relationship. Uh, so this is like the source code of the image um, that you have just seen with different cluster. Yeah, cluster two, three, four, five, and six and seven. And then the relations and these are all, uh, the contents are related to the references uh, that we have laid out uh, at the end of the of the of the page. So, so for for this particular work, um, we are interested to, as I mentioned, like explore the sources or literature and relations of the in increasing programmable uh, programmable image. So, but also this is also a piece as a response. Um, to the changing ontology of the image. So what is an image? It's never really stable. It's, it's constantly changing about this status. Right? Um, so the last bit, is there any questions so far?
the last bit is more collaborative actually. <laughs> there's a couple of there's a question that turned yeah. into a discussion or <laughs> something that uh, has developed in the chat, but let's bring it to you. So Andrew asks if your aim is to use technology to reveal or explore technology, are you mm -hmm. still tied to representations of technology rather than the non-representational nature of code? Um, no, I, I think it's like for me is I'm also interested in the tension between the materiality of language. It's not like like it depends on how you define representation as the as the outcome of how it looks in the image, right? But also in terms of the tension between like the natural language and also computer code syntax as well. And, and how this process of translation, if you want to use or, or execution in a, in a more computing terms, this executing of code and how this create new form of understanding of relations, not necessarily as a representation of, hey, I want to illustrate there is a relation between diagram and thought or, or image of, you know, not necessarily just only at this representation layer, but also through the process of diagramming as a way of rethinking about what are you diagramming with. And it is not necessarily something that you have planned, but it's, it's mutually informing each other in terms of, of the process. Yeah. There's uh, also another question uh, by Annette uh, saying first comments that uh, loves the aesthetics and generative possibilities of these images. And that says, uh, it's curious, if uh, you set the relationships by hand in the code, or is there a computational process to determine the, determine the, the relations? Yeah, there's also a computational process, of course, like determine the, the relation as well, because uh, from kind of like programming for this particular programming language, of course, is, is also a statistic uh, algorithm behind in terms of calculating how many nooks and how many entities behind so that it plays um, it plays the entity or plays the graph or, or the box or the, or the shape in a very particular place, right? But there's also a discrepancy between what actually has been doing in the background and actually what you know. I, I try to, um, by the way, I also try to open up for everyone as well um, for this particular work so that you can play around. With. So before I continue the answering the questions, just in case if some of you are interested in working on this. So it is just as simple as like starting out, um, oh, I have to start with this, I'm not sure. Just to make sure it is a graph width. So everyone, oh, okay, I should send this link as well. So while the others might tinker with this as well. Um, so for example, you can start with like something like diagram and then you can make a relation. Um, with image, for example. Then you started to see you can you can everyone can actually tune in, and also collaborate um, each other to to see how things uh, come into relations in a way. So I continue the questions uh, of Annette Wee. I think uh, she's asking about whether it's computational process to determine the relations. It is at some point it's also computational process, but at the same time I think there's a negotiation there when you see how it's actually formulate the relations, right? And it's also changed the way of how you look at an image, how you look at the relations. And then you start to make changes as well. And then you started to see, oh, actually this and this are also related. So I, 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 I see it's more like a, I'm not sure whether it's a collaboration, but it's, it's not totally computational deterministic. But there's also a human agency there that intervene the process um, of thinking about relations and processes. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to see like uh, so many people now uh, joining on the on the link and uh, I'm playing with with the code. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen like Bogart's question as well, uh, following on like on the previous one, saying uh, if you've written code to generate markup of, of graphics. Uh, sorry? On the, like just after Annette's question, uh, B. Bogart, you were asking if 
uh, if uh, you've written the code to generate markup or, or graphics? No, I'm, I, for me, I'm mainly right now, I'm in the stage of exploring uh, what might be the possibilities of graphics. Um, by, of course, it's also by looking into like different sample, right? Or, or in the gallery page that I've shown earlier, like how, what's the use case of graphics, right? In the computer science context. But then I'm also thinking about, there's a huge potential of these two, uh, not necessarily uh, just for like doing a data diagram or, or these kind of things, but I'm, I'm interested in how how diagramming with graphics as a way to open up my ways of thinking about relations uh, and entities and, and data. So I, I just give you another examples, like um, because for graphics, there are also different kinds of layout. So maybe I use this one, maybe easier. So for example, like this one is, is like a flow chart style. But actually, if you were if you are like modifying the layout uh, with like Nitto, is trying to draw undirectional graphs. So it becomes like a different arrangement of entities, right? So if you change the layout to another one called two pi, then it becomes more like, um, like a radial uh, layout. But then you can also change the layout to um, circle, which is more like a, a circular layout and then it suddenly like break apart of like the previous assumption that you have in relation to to the distance and, and space but then it create a new form of, of relations um so even like they are right now they are in these oval shapes so but if you also change them to 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 others, like even something without a direction, with the direction, like this one with arrows, and something that without an arrow, with multiple arrows, and with bidirectional arrows. Um, so I, I, I think I'm more in a stage of trying out um, uh, this different capability and also like this modes of like working together with, with graphics and see what it emerge. So, so the original, like the last part is really like um, exactly is trying out. So for this particular tool called HackMD, which is also my recent favorite uh, tool as well, a platform, uh, which is a collaborative platform based on Markdown that you can create um, like text publishing or code publishing, which is collaborative. And I really like this kind of real time assist is as if like live coding, right? So when you when you code something, then you immediately, if you just only add a little bit more relations, for example, so then you can also immediately see how it how 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 it execute uh, in another side, right? And it's create new new forms. So it's my recent tools that I used to use for teaching, but also I find it's may also, it's my experiment as well to see how it works in, in this kind of like conversational context with all of you. And so that people can also try out and, and see how things might work if you haven't worked with GraphWiz before. There are also other syntax, like for example, like for this one in particular, you can also customize with the fonts, uh, font name or font size, the direction, and also like creating the cluster. Uh, also, also do with some styling. And one of the really interesting thing about graphics is this thinking about ranking. So for example, like this one, uh, I have the line, line 38 is like rank equals same. I have thoughts, I have imaginaries, I have image, and then I force them to be on the same rank. So which means they are aligned in the same, um, uh, vertical position, right? So you are also intervening. I think it's also related to Annette V just now mentioned about whether it's a computational uh, deterministic uh, process and, and ways also the, the negotiation comes in is, 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 is this, is what, what kind of, also you have a particular desire of, of how an image would look like, but also at the same time, you embrace this kind of not knowing uh, as well. Yes. 
I think that's uh, pretty much uh, of my, and just in case if you, you, if you are interested in some of the links that I have mentioned in my web browser types, you can see all the links below. There's also the last one, uh, which is a quick guide uh, to graphics, just in case if some of you are interested in like um, the boxes and the lines and how you change certain things. This is also a pretty good uh, introduction as well. So I try to stop share screen and see if you have any questions or things that you want to discuss um, together. Thank you so much, Winnie. In the meantime, while well, everybody I think is still maybe playing a little bit um, and getting acquainted or accustomed to this uh, tool and to the um, things that you've shared with us. So in the meantime, let me be the first one to thank you for sharing your practice and showing so many interesting works. And as you said, the, the insides of them, the insides of programming um, in this virtual studio visit. So um, while we wait, I think people can are free to uh, yeah, if... ask questions in the chat or in the diagram at this point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go to the diagram as well. <laughs> yeah, just uh, a few, like uh, just in case there's uh, any other question that you might have. Uh, in fact, there's one coming from Jeff. From your... uh, on the chat saying to lean back to your earlier comments, the temporality is crucial, it seems, like live coding, as you say, related to the speed uh, through which we think. You might make some connections faster than thought process, making it more like drawing this way, making coding more like drawing. So I guess it's more of a comment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's like, this is also interesting, Jeff, when you, I think what this is also what we have experienced when we work on the what is an image, right, is, is that we, we try to modify the thing at the same time, just like here in a, on the HackMD, but then you actually, it actually runs much faster than what we, we have planned. And maybe we should say whether we have any plans and maybe maybe the, the executed version or, or like the outcome of it is also change the way of how we supposed to plan, right? So this kind of disruption of, of the structure is something that I find is, is, is quite in interesting, but also like you mentioned about this kind of immediacy, right? The, the very particular characteristics of live coding is this kind of immediate, it's like almost like a real time, like less than a second that you can see the immediate result. Not necessarily you are very thoughtful when, when, when we start typing the code sometime we oh let's try to see what it happened right but then but then it's also again like it's another forms of negotiation i have a question maybe in the meantime um maybe because you showed us a little bit about the what is an image uh, process or like the, the final diagram but how was the process of creating that and um, because that also comes uh, from a series of uh, scholars from sources so it's already somehow um, coming in certain blocks. But through this process of diagramming, did something uh, come up that, you know, by linking and disrupting, deconstructing this theory? How was that like? And how that changed the usual way of looking at these theories and uh, coming together in regular, regular processes? Yeah. Um, so the very in, maybe Jeff, if you have anything you want to chip in, feel free to do it as well. <laughs> Uh, you are here because um, I think that at the very beginning, the, the process is we, tr it seems like we are like doing like a very structural diagram from the very beginning, like, okay, so we have seven clusters and then each clusters, um, each cluster, we have different references to, for example, like poor image or what is an image. So we have a, a list of references that we want to incorporate in, in the final diagram. And then we also inspired by the, the book cover that we have, right, for, for this particular uh, book, uh, where we want to make individual word as, as a unit that can connect with one another, right? But at the same time, it's something that the audience can trace um, like one word over the other. Like some of them, they are the reference titles, like the book titles or article titles. Um, in there. So at the very beginning, it was very structured. Okay, so seven cluster and then different things. But then when, because they are also like overlapping words within the cluster, I mean, across different cluster, for example, like 
the word images, the word like artificial, the word like uh, image net, the word like machine, the word like network, right? There are some words actually coexist in other different clusters, right? So once we try to start off with the diagramming and it becomes like a chaos because because it's, it's, it's such immediate, like, like Jeff mentioned about like, it's immediately show you something that you feel, oh, it's, it's not quite right. But also at the same time, you immediately see the relations that we haven't seen before. Because um, there are certain words, as I mentioned, that appear in different cluster, that when you, when you have more than one times, like five times, six times, right? And then the same single word actually have a connections with different things. It just give you another ways of, of seeing. So, so in a way, we put a lot of time actually in tinkering with the two, in trying to disrupt the, the order as a way to think about how this process open up new forms of relations that we even thought, oh, okay, it's, it's quite nice. Actually, the colonial word is actually put at the bottom. How come is it put at the bottom? Do, you want to, do we want to make it apparent? So there's a lot of discussion actually in the, in the process. Thanks a lot. And if Jeff wants to chip in, we can unmute him because uh, um, we have these Zoom settings where everybody's. It'd be great, Jeff. You. That's why he's something. bringing it to the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so, but maybe we can also, he can also show up and say hi. I can say hello at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Jeff is, uh, we are also planning a workshop uh, next weekend, uh, which is on diagramming, which is also something uh, about drawing diagram, but also drawing with or coding with uh, graph bits as well as a way again to think about diagramming as a practice. So this is also not something that I am the only one who interested. It's actually Jeff is also super interested in in diagramming practice as well. Yeah, and I think for that for the, uh, just to chip in for that workshop, we have people with a dance background, people who are visual artists, and people who are working more with coding practices. So it's going to mm -hmm. be a really great experiment, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, workshop open to everybody. <laughs> it's, already, it's already sold out, I'm afraid. <laughs> Diagramming is really hot these days. <laughs> okay. But if you have, I mean, for the audience, if you have any thoughts about maybe, because I, I think some of you might be also working with diagram, because I would be also interested to hear your thoughts on maybe how do you think about the aesthetics of, of diagram, you know, or, or why you are interested in, in diagramming as, you know, as a way of, of opening up the discussion, if, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, I have also a question sent to me, uh, a question on patent, patent uh, diagrams, on the, on the diagrams and the drawings on patents, uh, asking uh, as they are used, like often used as a corporate practice to patent uh, workflow and ideas. Mm -hmm. And how does the work you are doing uh, here maybe react against this kind of practice? Uh, you, may, you mean it's like illustrating some kinds of patterns and thought and yeah. like, like mind mapping, you know, those kind of things, right? Yeah, how companies use uh, uh, diagrams to, to draw ideas also of, of products that are, that are trying to, to patent. Yeah, as far as I know, in companies, like people are very interested in like design thinking or design process, right? And they are, a lot of them, they use tools, for example, like Miro, right? Which I have used as well. It's a very good tool as well um, to collaborate with each other and also like drag and drop some of the, like the boxes that you can use for like drawing data flow diagram, or process flow as well in a collaborative environment with a very particular problem that might want to solve, right? Or might want to brainstorm on a particular project, right? Um, but I think um, I, I think for for this graph is is the particularity of graph is it for me like when when I look at like um, the one that I just show you like what is an image, this one, uh, and also the hack MD one that you have just seen. Um, Maybe because it's also I'm I'm into the field of uh, electronic literature as well. I at one point like last week basically when I'm preparing for today, I was actually thinking about oh, it actually not just only, it's not just only an image. 
but actually you can make something like an experimental literature, uh, like a poem or, or, or different forms of like text that's display in different spatial dimension that, that challenge the way of linear reading as well. So I, I think it's a different intention uh, in terms of like how you use the tools and how do you want to poke the tool, right? Because sometimes you know the capability of the tools, right? But I guess I also know sort of like the capability of graph reads, which is used for very particular uh, data science projects, right? But I'm also at the same time thinking about how might we think about the ready-made tool in a different way. So it's kind of like reappropriation of of these tools used to be for for science, right? But but how artists could use it in a different way and open up new ways of thinking. So actually there's one question coming over from our Twitch chat, which is uh, very much connected to the last thing you said. Vamos Boar asks, how do you see the critical software practice intersect with creative coding? Hmm. Okay, then it's something related to the book. <laughs> actually, this is actually what we have been uh, what Jeff and I have been doing, um, I think it's what we have uh, trying to do in terms of critical practice is not just only to consider tools as a way to actualize your, your thinking or, or like just only like you, you want to express something with the tool, but I think it's through the process of coding, it is also important to question how how the things are being structured. For, just to give you an example, like object-oriented programming, which is uh, very common in a lot of uh, programming language and is a very particular programming paradigm, right? But in terms of like crafting out these kind of objects, is a very particular ways of structuring the data and also like imagining how or how you how you would simplify like a complex object into a form that has a certain kinds of behaviors it's, it's a particular way of styling and thinking and modeling the world right so in a way i think what is crucial about critical practice or artistic practice is it's also a matter of questioning about what you have been using and, and and even you are using a for loop, for example, like it's also a very common function in, in programming. So how these kind of loop actually open up a different ways of thinking about time in machines, or how is it like we configure the experience of time from a human perspective, right? So then you also give uh, like considering the tool itself, not just only tool for usage, but the tool for questioning. I think is this is something related to Famker's um, she talked about a server, a feminist server, which is like a thinking tool. So for me, programming or creative coding or coding is a thinking tool for me. It's helped me to, to think about the being, think, think about what I've been making and what are the consequences that I have made to the world and what are the structures, what are the assumptions behind that create uh, different forms of impacts in the world. Thanks a lot. And on that note, I think it's now a good time to wrap it here and thank again um, Winnie from all the people left in Twitch and from also the people in the chat in Zoom and from us too. We remind everybody that we'll be back in two weeks with Andy yeah. uh, Mansu on the 30th of June. 30th of June, yeah, in two, two weeks from now uh, on uh, with Almeric, uh, Mansu, and Roel Roscamabin. Uh, we will be doing a quite a special uh, screen work, uh, and we invite you to come back uh, then in two, in two weeks again. Uh, meanwhile, I, I just want to just uh, say thank you, Winnie, for the for the very interesting talk and all this like uh, introduction to diagramming and, and, and coding diagrams. It's been super interesting. Um, Thank, Thank you, you for having me as well, um, and also like both Photographers Gallery and Photo Museum and all the audience pay an effort like on Friday uh, to join <laughs> this session. <laughs> <laughs>